hat, a glove, a trail of blood. Investigators believed they led to a killer. The prosecution thought it had an airtight case. Hard evidence bolstered by rigid science. The defense argued the evidence was tainted and the science was shoddy. The jury expressed reasonable doubt about the guilt of Orenthal James Simpson and serious doubts about forensics. In courts of law and the halls of science, it was the trial of the century. Los Angeles, California, a town famous for sunshine, celebrities, and scandal. But even by LA standards, the events of June 1994 were electrifying. In an affluent suburb, two people were found brutally murdered. The prime suspect was a football star turned film actor. All eyes focused on the Los Angeles County Courthouse as the trial unfolded like a Hollywood movie. For 10 months, the state of California versus Orenthal James Simpson played out in the courtroom and on televisions around the world. On October 3rd, 1995, the world held its breath as the jury rendered its decision. It took just under three hours to reach its verdict. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Orenthal James Simpson, not guilty of the crime of murder in violation of Penal Code Section 187A, a felony upon Nicole Brown Simpson. A human being the verdict was a shock to the Los Angeles County District Attorneys who tried the case and to the families of the victims. But for the defense, it was confirmation that the quality of the evidence must be weighed before depriving a person of his freedom. From the start, Simpson was also being tried in the court of public opinion. Though many applauded the verdict, others were stunned. Homicide detective Tom Lang of the Los Angeles Police Department was one of the men in charge of overseeing the evidence collection at the crime scene. There are people on death row, death row. There are people that have indeed been put to death on much, much less evidence, on a tenth of that evidence. Defense attorney Barry Sheck was a member of Simpson's dream team and one of the most vocal critics of how the evidence against O.J. Simpson was collected and processed. The way that crime scene was handled by the criminalists from the Los Angeles Police Department, by the uh, people in the crime lab when they did the initial DNA testing, and by the medical examiner's office was uh, shameful. Soon after the trial began, it became clear that more than Simpson was on trial. Forensic science would also have its day in court. Could the evidence and the methods under which it was collected withstand the defense team's harsh scrutiny? There were no eyewitnesses to the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and her friend Ronald Goldman. But from the very beginning, the prosecution thought strong circumstantial evidence pointed to the killer. In the Brentwood section of Los Angeles, in the early morning of June 13, 1994, a dog led some neighbors to the front walk of Nicole Brown Simpson's condominium. There lay the mutilated bodies of Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman. Their killer, or killers, had slit their throats. 
bloody shoe prints and drops of blood to the left of them led away from the murder scene toward a back alley. Police believed the prints belonged to someone who'd been bleeding from the left hand as he quit the scene. Also found near the bodies were a blood-soaked glove and a pullover cap. The killer had apparently left them behind. After the crime scene had been secured, the officers called the homicide division. Detective Lang received a call at 3 a.m. on the 13th to take charge of the investigation. He arrived at the scene around 4.25 a.m. The first impression was that it was an overkill, uh, probably a rage, some type of rage killing, that there was one killer. The ground was littered with potential clues. A leather glove, a ski cap, Ronald Goldman's pager, and his car keys, a dog's footprints in the blood, and one set of size 12 shoe prints leading away from the bodies. Detectives had to determine which were important. They started with the blood along with the heel-to-toe stride analysis of the bloody shoe prints, told us that the source was, in fact, walking. Uh, not what you would expect after committing a brutal double murder. There's, a, there's an interrupt, interruption in his gait, and he stops, and there's two or three prints that uh, point back towards where he was, indicating the possibility that the killer stopped and looked back. Now, when he did that, was he looking, say, hey, I lost my cap, I lost my glove, should I go back and get him? No, I better get out of here, it's very dark down there. Uh, so that may have been that hesitation in that, in that stride that we saw in those bloody shoe prints. At the request of his superior, Lang left the crime scene to notify the victim's estranged husband former football star and broadcaster, O.J. Simpson, that his ex-wife had been killed. He traveled the short distance to Simpson's home on North Rockingham Drive with his partner, Phil Van Adder, and other detectives assigned to the case. One of them named Mark Furman. It was the first time Lang and Van Adder had worked with Mr. Furman. Mr. Simpson, this is the police. Mr. Simpson, this is the police. Will you please open the gate? They approached the front gate of Simpson's home. Though they could see lights on in the house, no one responded to the buzzer. According to the testimony of Mark Furman at trial, he then noticed a white Ford Bronco outside the gate. It was parked at an odd angle. Through the window, he saw a small black bag bearing the label Orenthal Productions. Furman concluded the car belonged to O.J. Simpson. He then called Tom Lang over to show him something else he had found. Near the door handle on the driver's side, there appeared to be a spot of blood. Lang testified that the detectives feared Simpson was injured and decided to enter Simpson's property to investigate, even though they didn't have a warrant. Furman climbed over the five-foot wall and let the other detectives in. Lang and Van Adder checked the front door while Furman investigated behind the house. didn't appear as if anyone was home. Detectives roused Cato Kalin from a bungalow at the rear of the house. Kalin, a guest of Simpson's, wasn't certain of Simpson's whereabouts, but told the detectives he'd heard several loud thumps behind his room earlier that evening. 
here? Yeah. Okay. Police later learned that Simpson had left hours earlier for Chicago. While the other detectives continued their search, Furman, alone, went to investigate the cause of the strange noises Kalin reported. He found a bloody glove in plain view. It appeared to match the blood-soaked glove found at the murder scene. Furman brought Van Adder to show him his discovery. Simpson's Rockingham estate was declared the second crime scene of the night. O.J. Simpson was now a prime suspect. He was not a suspect initially when we went on the property. Uh, but once the glove had been found, he, he most definitely became a suspect. According to the testimony of Philip Van Adder, as dawn broke over Los Angeles, he was able to see drops of blood in Simpson's driveway. They led from the Bronco to Simpson's house. Later, Van Atter found drops of blood in the entrance hall. As he looked into the Bronco, he saw still more traces of blood on the console and seat. Van Atter ordered the car seized, and by 10.45, obtained a warrant to search the house for additional evidence. Meanwhile, Simpson returned from Chicago. Police had notified him by phone of his ex-wife's murder. He agreed to be interviewed by Detectives Lang and Van Adder without the presence of his lawyer. The detectives noticed a deep cut on a finger of his left hand. Van Adder asked Simpson repeatedly about the injury. His responses seemed inconsistent and contradictory. First, he said he cut his finger in Chicago on a broken glass. Then he changed his story and said he may have cut it in L.A. and reopened it in Chicago. To Lang and Van Atter, Simpson's explanation seemed evasive. They began to investigate his whereabouts on the night of the murders. You were cutting the knife, cutting the orange then with a knife in your right hand? Police located the limousine driver who took Simpson to Los Angeles International Airport for his flight to Chicago. He had arrived at Simpson's estate ahead of schedule at 10.25 p.m. Mr. Simpson? He testified he didn't see the Bronco and received no answer when he pressed the buzzer at the gate. He then drove around the block and returned shortly before 11 p.m. The driver said at that time he noticed the Bronco parked on the street and saw an African-American male walking hurriedly up the driveway into the house. Then he saw a light go on. O.J. Simpson told him over the intercom that he'd overslept and would be down in a moment. Police believe the murders took place around 10.30 the prosecution felt Simpson's alibi couldn't hold up. They now had to find a motive. To build their case, police interviewed friends and family members of Nicole Brown. They suggested the killing was the final act of a vengeful and abusive husband. Nicole, battered and bruised, had called the police in 1989, charging that Simpson had beaten her. Can you get someone over here now to 325 Gretna Green? He's back. Please. Well, okay, what does he look like? He's O.J. Simpson. I think you know his record. Could you just have somebody okay. over here? Okay, what is he doing there? He just drove up again. Can you just, just drove somebody up. over? Okay, wait a minute, what kind of car is he in? He's in a white Bronco, but first of all, he broke the back door down to get in. Okay, <laughs> wait a minute, what's your name? Nicole Simpson. Okay. For his actions, a court ordered Simpson to perform community service. More recently, friends said he'd been stalking Nicole, threatening her and pressuring her to renew their marriage. Nicole had also become concerned about a missing set of keys to her condominium. They would resurface after his arrest. Days before she was murdered, she told her mother that they were missing and she had thought Simpson had stolen them. 
and we find them on his person. Based on the evidence they had collected, the LAPD filed formal charges against Orenthal James Simpson for the double murders. He was scheduled to deliver himself into custody at 11 a.m. on June 17, 1994. When he didn't arrive at police headquarters, the LAPD went to arrest him, only to find he had fled. As they began an extensive search, a television news helicopter began broadcasting images of Simpson and his friend A.C. Cowlings driving along the freeways of Los Angeles in a white Ford Bronco. After driving back to his Rockingham mansion, Simpson surrendered to police. The circumstantial and forensic evidence appeared to confirm Simpson's guilt. The prosecution felt it now had a case that could be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. Instead, the case would raise a cloud of doubt about forensic science itself. A week into the investigation of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman, the LAPD turned its case over to the district attorney's office. Prosecutors, along with the LAPD's Tom Lang and Phil Van Atter, were increasingly confident their case would hold up in court. Phil and I uh, talk about our last 10 murders combined don't have this evidence. So unquestionably, there's more evidence than that I challenge any prosecutor to tell me they've seen more, unless you've had it in, uh, uh, you know, in Yankee Stadium in front of uh, 80,000 people. I've never seen more evidence, or even heard of more evidence in a criminal case than this. The prosecution accumulated what it felt to be a mountain of evidence. The two blood-stained gloves, blood found at the scene, in Simpson's Bronco, and on his clothing, as well as hair found on the knit cap, consistent with that of an African-American male. This is very important evidence. Uh, circumstantial, yes, but extremely important evidence. What's interesting on this case is every little thing like that ended up in the lap of O.J. Simpson. Nothing was exculpatory. Nothing said someone else was involved or a second person. Nothing says this guy didn't do it. The trial of O.J. Simpson for the murder of his ex-wife, Nicole Brown, and her friend, Ronald Goldman, began in January 1995 in the Los Angeles County Courthouse. Because California state courts allow TV cameras, an audience of millions followed the trial day after day. It was the most watched trial in history. For LAPD detective Tom Lang, this made testifying difficult. So I'm on the stand, and after all these days, and I've got a jury glaring at me, above them is this camera with 50-some-odd million people watching me live. Am I concentrating on that camera and all these millions of people that I know are watching me, or am I concentrating on the attorney and the questions being asked of me? That's the negative impact that that much publicity can have on a case. And it did play a factor here. The prosecution would try to prove that O.J. Simpson acted alone, killing Brown and Goldman with brutal efficiency. Brown's blood was found on Goldman and vice versa. To the prosecution, this meant the same knife had been used to kill both victims. To better understand how the murders could have been committed, the prosecution sought the expertise of crime scene reconstructionist and former homicide detective Rod Englert. So I have to just look at the evidence, let the evidence do the talking, and then find support for that evidence to work out a logical sequence. That's what a reconstructionist does. Seven weeks after the murders, Englert first walked through the crime scene in an attempt to piece together the elements of his reconstruction. So the first thing that I did was to get a feel for the scene, the dimensions, the space, walk through Nicole's home, upstairs, downstairs, and looking, and you might find this interesting, you know what I was looking for? I don't know what I was looking for. I just know it when I see it. 
I know what's out of place because of that experience. Not that I'm cerebral or anything, but I, you just, you know, having seen these so many times, you just sort of, you recognize when something's not right. This reconstruction is based on Englert's written report as presented to the court. It speculates how the crime may have occurred and how long it might take, assuming the prosecution's theory that O.J. Simpson was the killer. The defense contended that the murders would have involved a prolonged struggle of as much as 15 minutes. The prosecution, however, believed they took a total of 30 seconds. The evidence suggests that when Nicole came out of her door and were going in slow motion, that she was approached by O.J. Simpson, who hit her on the head numerous times, and then she has three stab wounds to the left side of her neck that went very, very deep, and she goes down, causing uh, abrasions to her elbow, to her face, from hitting the concrete. Then after she is down on the ground, then Ron Goldman walks up, and when he walks up, an altercation is... Between the two of them, the glove comes off because O.J. had his left arm around. The glove drops in the scene, and he incapacitates Ron Goldman and then goes back to Nicole and then picks up her hair, cuts her throat from left to right all the way back to her, uh, her, her spine, lowers her head down, and then with the evidence that is on the knife, goes back to and then cuts the throat of Ron Goldman and then he's bleeding on the bars and then lays him over on his left side through that process and this is the position that Goldman was in somewhat. Then he goes back to Nicole, steps on her back, there's a foot impression in this area on her back and then leaves the scene. Englert also came up with a theory about how the killer's glove had been left at the crime scene and how O.J. Simpson cut his hand. That consistent with the glove being removed, this is how this occurrence happened, that during the struggle the glove came off and dropped to the ground and notice that the knife blade at this point and stick your finger out would be parallel to where O.J. Simpson's hand would be and that could come across and cut this uh, incision that was on his finger. Everything is parallel. Uh, there's nothing cross uh, section to it, and this is consistent with the evidence of a struggle, which can happen. Prosecutors felt that by cutting his own finger, Simpson had inadvertently left the trail of blood that by itself was highly incriminating. That, plus his motive and lack of an alibi, was quite possibly enough to obtain a conviction but prosecutors still had mostly circumstantial evidence against him. They would attempt to ice the case through DNA collected from the bloodstains. DNA analysis over the last two decades had begun to revolutionize criminal investigations. Until recently, blood evidence had limited use in helping identify criminals. By examining what are called the antigens in blood, scientists could determine its type, A, O, B, or AB, but could not trace a blood sample to any one individual. Beginning in the 1980s, science promised to make blood evidence much more significant by examining its DNA. Found in every cell of our bodies, DNA contains the coded instructions of our being. The color of our eyes, our height and hair color, the size of our brain, and so on. Since no two humans are alike, except identical twins, it follows that no two people have the same set of DNA instructions. By breaking the code, scientists have been able to identify the patterns or markers that distinguish one person's DNA from another's. Two tests are used to isolate and identify human DNA. One, called polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, requires a small sample of blood cells, which are then replicated to produce a larger sample. For the other test, called restriction fragment length polymorphism, or RFLP, researchers must start with a much larger sample of cells. Most of the testing in the Simpson case used the simpler PCR test. 
Though most courts have accepted DNA evidence, there remains some controversy about its reliability and methods. Like critics of fingerprint science a hundred years ago, some question whether we have truly broken the code. In addition to that, DNA science is difficult to explain and, for many jurors, hard to understand. The results of DNA analysis in the Simpson case were stunning. A prosecution expert testified that the drops of blood leading away from the murder scene were probably O.J. Simpson's. The odds the blood came from someone else were calculated at 1 in 170 million. Blood found on the back gate at the murder scene was also identified as Simpson's. Here, the odds of it being someone else's were one in several billion, greater than the population of the planet. This essentially proved the blood was Simpson's. Simpson's blood was also identified on the Bronco's door panel, dashboard, and near the headlight switch. Simpson told police he'd last driven the Bronco before dark on the day of the murders. Crime scene reconstructionist Rod Englert. When do you turn on your headlights? Daytime? Not really. So there was a transfer on that dash which was blood consistent with O.J. Simpson's DNA. But even more remarkable was the console uh, between the passenger seat and the driver's seat. And it had numerous transfer patterns. One was a hand pattern on the back far side of the console, on the console between the passenger seat and the console, which you can see distinctive finger marks, a transfer. And then there's another swipe. These transfers belong to, and it was blood consistent with, the DNA of Ron Goldman and Nicole Simpson. But for the defense, Forensic blood spatter expert Herbert McDonald testified that he was leery of the blood found in the Bronco because it was so minute. I don't see how anyone could have been in a struggle with Ron Goldman or, for that matter, Nicole Brown, where the blood was all over the area and not got much more blood on them than was reportedly on Mr. Simpson or in his Bronco. The, uh, the Bronco, in my estimation, had less than one drop total in that whole vehicle. Regardless of the blood in the Bronco, prosecution DNA tests had identified the ample blood from both murder victims on the glove found behind Cato Kalin's bungalow. The forensic evidence gathered by the police and prosecution pointed a bloody finger at O.J. Simpson. The defense would point its finger at the police. The defense in the Simpson case would focus its attack on a chain of events beginning in the wee hours of June 13, 1994. Defense attorney Barry Sheck contended that what happened and what didn't happen in the 24 hours following the murders was enough to cast doubt on the prosecution's case. There was a lack of coordinated effort between the criminalists, the detectives and the medical examiners. And you want to make sure that you keep everybody out of that crime scene until you have looked at it carefully, looking for the unexpected, making sure that you have seen absolutely everything before you allow all kinds of brass and uh, uh, you know supervisors to walk in and out, walk in and out, walk in and out, and begin to destroy the scene. The defense set out to prove that evidence gathering went from bad to worse. Well, the significance of the Simpson case lies in the way that crime scene was handled and its implications for the lab work. And we're talking here about the way that the criminalists on the scene collected the evidence, the way it was initially processed in the laboratories, and the way the medical examiner's office dealt with that. At the scene of the murders on South Bundy Drive, camera crews arrived at 7.30 a.m., Rod Englert believes the cameras were a distraction that seriously affected the way the crime scene was handled. 
It's just really difficult to do your job when just a few feet away you've got 15, 20 cameras over your shoulder that's going to be second-guessing you. Well, what are you thinking about? Are you thinking about the evidence while you're down on your hands and knees? Or are you thinking about these people shooting up the back of your dress? You see what I'm saying? Detective Lang, in charge of the investigation, couldn't stop the crews from filming. But he wanted to shield vital crime scene information so it wouldn't become public knowledge. Lang covered Brown's body with a blanket he found in her house. This would draw criticism at trial. Uh, the bodies, of course, themselves are evidence. The blood patterns on the body are evidence. If you have a camera crew show up and videotape that, you've compromised it, and you can't necessarily use that if you had a potential suspect or a witness that you'd interviewed down the line. The media today has lens that could highlight a human hair at 200 feet. You know, we're just honing in on the crime scene, on the one victim, Nicole Brown, in all of the evidence, compromising that evidence. That's one reason that body was covered. They took a blanket, then they put it over the bodies, and they brought hairs and fibers all across that scene, when obviously some of the key pieces of uh, evidence in the case might come down to uh, hairs and fibers, where did they come from? Only one of the bodies had been covered, and Lang felt his reason was valid. Did we contaminate it? There's always that possibility, but in this case it was exactly the right thing to do because it was no contamination, there were no foreign hairs, fibers, or debris found on Nicole Brown or her clothing. It was a tight, tightly knit, clean hospital blanket that was used. The cameras, meanwhile, became a useful tool for the defense. We were able to get uh, some of the videotape of the cameras looking in as the officers were processing the crime scene. and able to demonstrate that uh, they weren't changing their gloves, that they were commingling some of the evidence, uh, uh, that people were walking in and out of the crime scene uh, at times when they probably shouldn't have been. The defense began a theme it would stress throughout the trial, that the blood evidence in the case had been contaminated. When blood is shed, bacteria immediately begins to break it down, along with its DNA. The defense suggested improper handling of the blood swatches had allowed the blood to deteriorate too far to permit accurate test results. Chief criminalist Dennis Fung had relied primarily on swabbing the blood at the murder scene and transferring it to cotton swatches. The swatches were supposed to be dried, then wrapped in cloth bindles for transfer to the lab. But several of the bindles were bloodstained, proving the swatches were wet when placed inside. That could encourage bacterial contamination. Fung also left the blood evidence in his enclosed van for hours without air conditioning in the hot California sun. And the last thing in the world one should do is put it into a plastic bag and stick it onto a truck, a crime scene truck, and let it bake for seven hours because you're going to degrade the DNA there. That's a terrible mistake from the point of view of a criminalist, isn't it? Yes. The theme of contamination was one of the most hotly contested issues at the trial. Murders do not occur in a sterile lab setting. Uh, there was contamination, there always has been. But they would lead you to believe that this somehow affected the outcome of this blood evidence, and the reality of it is it did not. The fact of the matter is, if you're looking strictly at the DNA in this case, you could have collected all of those blood samples and placed them out on Bundy Drive for a month, and let the traffic run up and down over them, and then collect them. Is that going to contaminate them? Well, sure it's going to contaminate them. Is that going to change the DNA properties? Is that going to make O.J. Simpson's DNA appear there? No. It's there or it's not there. It's as simple as that. But Sheck raised another argument, that criminalists at the scene may have commingled some of the blood samples so that no one could say whose blood was whose. 
Dennis Fung had first collected drops of Simpson's blood at O.J.'s home, then arrived at the murder scene to collect blood samples there. A grueling cross-examination by Barry Sheck raised serious doubts that Fung had changed his gloves, or even worn gloves, while collecting evidence at the murder scene. And there were some moments during the trial where uh, I guess the moment that everybody remembers most is that uh, uh, Mr. Fung was picking up that envelope from the scene and he was claiming that he of course did that with his gloves on. All of a sudden in the courtroom, in a way we'd never even done it before because we had a better video machine in the courtroom, and you could see very, very clearly uh, Dennis Fung grabbing the envelope uh, and touching it without his glove on. The defense went a step further. It argued that besides the inept collection procedures, more errors were committed when the samples were analyzed. It contended that the handling of the samples in the laboratory was so sloppy that the test results could not be relied upon. This is a lab that was operating without a protocol, without procedures that people were trained in. Nobody ever taught them how to do it right. That was apparent. As the defense steadily chipped away at the prosecution's case, another theory began to take shape. Somebody played with this evidence. A police conspiracy to frame O.J. Simpson. The mountain of forensic evidence in the Simpson case was turning to rubble. The defense now raised its own theory. Some of the evidence had been planted. The proof began at the gate of Nicole Brown's condominium. According to testimony, the police returned to the murder scene three weeks after the murders and found Simpson's blood on the back gate near the bloody shoe prints of the killer. Because it was missed during the initial investigation, the defense suggested it may not have been there at the time of the murder. Detective Tom Lang acknowledges the blood on the gate should have been collected earlier. Generally at a, at a crime scene, the detective will do a final walkthrough of the criminalists, photography people, latent print people, other detectives who have done canvassing and other things, and they'll walk through, did we do this, did we do that. If that had occurred here, we wouldn't have had the problem with the blood on the rear gate. During his initial questioning, Simpson consented to giving police a blood sample. The defense suggested someone had planted some of it on the gate. Though presumably exposed to the elements three weeks longer, the DNA from the blood on the gate hadn't decomposed as much as the DNA from the blood collected hours after the crime. About the same time Simpson's blood was found on Nicole Brown's gate, Brown's blood was discovered on a pair of socks recovered from Simpson's house the night of the murders. Its significance wasn't missed by the prosecution or the defense. The prosecution's crime scene reconstructionist, Rod Englert, believes the drops of blood were spattered on the socks as Simpson stepped in his ex-wife's blood. And on the socks, we have a projected blood pattern of blood that had to be airborne. When it landed on these socks, creating numerous spots around the ankle and the front of one of them, and numerous match head size spots on the other. Now, I don't know which one was right or left, but those spots stopped at where the shoe would be on if it was a regular street size shoe. Those spots stopped at a certain level on both of them where pant legs would be. And so when that was analyzed, I remember Tom Lane calling that evening, very excited, and said, we were right. It was Nicole's blood. To test his theory on how the blood would have been spattered on Simpson, Englert staged a reenactment. To recreate the struggle, he used police officers dressed in white so the blood would show up better. The white set matched the exact dimensions of the murder scene. The violent struggle between the killer and the second victim, Ronald Goldman, took place in close proximity to the deepening pool of blood from Nicole. 
Englert matched the amount of blood from the crime scene exactly and found that it would have been difficult to avoid spattering, as the test amply demonstrated. Forensics experts Herbert McDonnell and Henry Lee conducted their own examination of one of the socks found in Simpson's bedroom. Well, the ankle stain was very large. It was not spatter. Both men claimed the blood had not been spattered at all. It was not projected there. It was not dripped there. It was not cast off and landed there by flying through the air. It was transferred from contact by something that had blood on it. Because the blood on the socks was not found between the fibers, McDonald concluded it had been wiped across the sock. The margin around the center of that stain shows blood on the surface of the fibers only. It does not show blood permeating between the fibers. Therefore, we know it's transferred. McDonnell also found evidence that Simpson's foot was not in the sock when the blood transfer took place. McDonnell uses a shirt sleeve to demonstrate how he thinks the blood was applied to the sock. He places a single drop of blood on top of the cloth, which he calls surface one. He rubs the blood in, and it soaks onto the back, or surface two. The blood is then transferred to surface three, but does not soak through to surface four. McDonnell and Lee found that blood had seeped through from sides one and two of Simpson's sock onto side three, which would have been impossible if Simpson's foot had been inside the sock between surface two and surface three. To the defense, this was compelling evidence the blood could have been planted on the sock either at the crime scene or while the socks were in police custody. The conspiracy theory was supported by defense experts who found the presence of a substance called EDTA in both the blood on the sock and the blood from the gate at the crime scene. EDTA is a preservative added to blood in a test tube to prevent it from clotting. It's also present naturally in small quantities in the human bloodstream. But witnesses testified that the amount of EDTA in the two bloodstains was much higher than normal, suggesting the blood on the gate and the socks came from the lab. Down but not defeated, the prosecution brought out its most dramatic evidence. The trial of O.J. Simpson reached a turning point with the pair of gloves. Co-mingled on them was the blood of both murder victims. According to testimony at trial, one glove was found at the scene of the murders, the other on Simpson's property on Rockingham Drive. But a now infamous courtroom demonstration seriously undermined the evidence. The prosecution team decided to have Simpson try on the gloves in front of the jury. The result was a disaster. The gloves, apparently, did not fit. The prosecution was forced to scramble for an explanation. A former executive of the company that manufactured the gloves testified that when soaked in blood and allowed to dry, the gloves might shrink 10 to 15 percent. To see if that was possible, McDonnell tested this theory with an identical pair of gloves. So I took the gloves that were sent to me and I poured my own blood over these gloves in a controlled condition so I knew exactly how much blood remained on the gloves. They were really wet. The, the blood was worked into them and then they were allowed to dry. Prior to the experiment, McDonnell photocopied the glove to document its size. After the bloody glove dried, he again photocopied it for comparison. It had shrunk less than 1%. Next, he wanted to find out how small the glove would become if it really did shrink as much as the manufacturer claimed. He used the photocopier to reduce the glove to 10 and 15% of its original size. Then he compared the reductions to the original photocopy. 
the change was enormous. At 15%, the gloves would have shrunk over an inch and a half. In McDonald's opinion, the change was too drastic. Since it seemed unlikely that the gloves belonged to Simpson, the defense had an opening to expand its theory of a police conspiracy. It had already suggested that someone had planted blood on the back gate at the murder scene and on the socks from Simpson's bedroom. Now it put forward the theory that the glove found on Simpson's property had also been deliberately planted. Mark Furman had been alone when he found the glove at Simpson's house. He'd also been among the first detectives to arrive at Brown's condominium, where the first glove had been found. The defense suggested that Furman had picked up the second glove at the scene of the murders, taken it with him to Simpson's estate, and planted it on the pathway behind Cato Kalin's bungalow. For LAPD detective Lang, it would have been impossible for Furman to have found the second glove at the scene of the murders because he was the 13th detective to sign the log. Uh, because 12 people there before Furman only saw one glove. And it's very logical the way Furman found the glove. He was doing what anybody should have done, following up on an interview with Cato Kalin. Taking its theory a step further, the defense suggested that before he planted the glove, Furman may have used it to smear the blood of the victims inside Simpson's Bronco. It was a claim that made the LAPD's blood boil. Mark Furman did not plant any blood. Absolutely, uh, he did not do it. He would have no knowledge how to do that. And uh, there's no evidence of that whatsoever, none. There was no sprinkling of blood in that Bronco whatsoever. There weren't any drops. That was all transfers. And the significance of it was that it was transferred in the patterns consistent with one who had blood on his hands or possible clothing to get in and open the door, open the interior door, turn on the lights, touch over here with a hand transfer, and if implements or something was placed on the seat to be able to do that, someone has to, would have to be so knowledgeable and so cerebral about predicting what was going to happen that they, I, I don't have that capability. I don't know anybody that does to be able to make it consistent. And then to do it on the socks at the house, uh, impossible. The defense had no real evidence that the glove was planted, and at first it could provide no motive for Furman to plant it. But that soon changed. You say on your oath that you have not addressed any black person as a nigger or spoken about black people as niggers in the past 10 years, Detective Furman. That's what I'm saying, sir. So that anyone who comes to this court and quotes you as using that word in dealing with African Americans would be a liar, would they not, Detective Furman? Yes, they would. All of them, correct? All of them. In one of the trial's most dramatic moments, the defense introduced evidence that Furman had expressed hatred toward blacks. The defense had found its final weapon for casting doubt on the prosecution's case. It played the race card. Tom Lang feels the issue of race was irrelevant. Furman's uh, racism or whatever else Furman is has nothing to do with the two people getting murdered. Uh, it's unfortunate he was in the middle of it for the first couple hours, but you have to deal with that. And if you think he's planted evidence or anything else, we need to see evidence of that. Case number BA097211. The prosecution had been so certain of its forensic evidence, it had withheld other evidence pointing to Simpson's guilt for fear of exhausting the jury's patience. A, a felony upon Nicole Brown. But the defense had effectively nullified each piece it presented, claiming it had been contaminated by sloppy handling and a disregard for the procedures established to protect it. On October 3rd, 1995, Orenthal James Simpson was found not guilty of the murders of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. Tom Lang is convinced the jury disregarded the compelling evidence the prosecution had put forward. The prosecution proved their case beyond a reasonable doubt. I've never seen so much evidence. Even there was a tremendous amount of evidence they didn't put on, but there was a tremendous amount they did. I've never seen that much put on in a case. 
When a jury comes back in two and a half hours, it's pretty evident they didn't do what they were instructed to do, regardless of the outcome, regardless if it's guilty or not guilty. They did not do what they were told to do, and the court did not follow up on that. Defense attorney Barry Sheck feels the jury's verdict was based squarely on reasonable doubt. He believes the way the LAPD handled the evidence was totally inadequate people in the forensic community recognized that this was wrong, that these procedures were unacceptable. The more sophisticated the technology, uh, the more powerful the forensic evidence, the greater the importance that these people uh, develop and uh, are able to maintain a high sense of independence and professionalism. That kind of laboratory it's the kind of laboratory, the kind of crime scene people that are our best protection for convicting the truly guilty and exonerating the truly innocent. After Simpson's acquittal, lawyers representing the victim's families in a civil suit would learn from the mistakes of the criminal trial. They would bring in circumstantial evidence not presented earlier such as the fact that Simpson owned a pair of the expensive Bruno Mali shoes, like those that left their imprint at the scene of the crime. The prosecution only had to convince a majority of the jurors beyond a 50% certainty that Simpson was guilty. The prosecution was successful, and O.J. Simpson was found liable for the deaths of Ronald Goldman and Nicole Brown. He was required to pay $33.5 million to the victim's families. During the criminal trial, the prosecution had what it believed to be irrefutable evidence. It was wrong. Careless handling and collection techniques robbed the evidence of its power. It served only to raise doubt. The aftermath of the Simpson trial resonated throughout the halls of science. Forensics itself was put on the stand and it became clear that the most reliable witness can also be the most easily compromised. An elderly man is shot dead in front of his family at a July 4th celebration. No one knows where the bullet came from. How can police track down his killer? A charismatic leader of the Black Panthers is killed in a police raid. His supporters say he was assassinated. The police claim they shot him in self-defense. Can a forensic expert determine who is lying? A child dies in a drive-by shooting. Can a state-of-the-art computer link evidence from this crime to another and win a conviction? It takes a split second for a gun to deliver death. Solving the crime takes much longer but with increasing speed, expertise, and accuracy, forensic detectives are zeroing in on their deadly target. In Bloomingdale, Illinois, a small town 40 miles northwest of Chicago, July 4th, 1989 began like any other Independence Day. Like people all across America, families and friends gathered to celebrate the country's birthday by relaxing and holding the traditional backyard barbecue. Kids amused themselves with sparklers while eagerly waiting for the sun to set and the town fireworks display to begin. On the picnic grounds, a carnival provided an endless array of diversions, something for everyone to enjoy. But for one Bloomingdale family, the celebration ended in tragedy. In a field near the picnic grounds, the family joined a crowd gathered to await the fireworks. The grandfather passed time playing with his grandchildren. Then, without warning, he tumbled out of his chair. 
His wife thought he had a heart attack. What's the matter? Is everything okay? Two off-duty detectives happened to be picnicking with their own families nearby. They rushed to offer assistance. When they turned over the man's body, they found a bloody wound beneath his ribs, a bullet hole. This 64-year-old grandfather had been shot dead. Shock was followed almost immediately by mystification. No one had heard a shot or seen anything. A search of the field came up empty. No gun, not even a spent cartridge could be found. The killing was the most baffling case the Bloomingdale police had ever encountered. Who had shot the man and why? Unraveling the mystery, forging a link between victim and killer would demand all the ingenuity forensic experts could muster. Lieutenant Richard Vaughn is the ballistics examiner at the DuPage County Sheriff's Department. As soon as an autopsy had been performed, the Bloomingdale police called him in. The coroner confirmed that a bullet had struck the victim on the right side, then penetrated beneath the rib cage, causing his death. He also recovered the bullet. Fortunately, it had not hit bone and was in near pristine condition. Vaughn's initial task was to try to establish what kind of gun had fired it, so he and detectives could begin to look for the gun and, ultimately, its owner. Under his scrutiny, the bullet's size and weight and any physical marks could provide vital information. The evidence bullet in this case, uh, the first question would be what caliber is it? Caliber is determined by the weight of the bullet and by the diameter of the bullet. Vaughn started by weighing the bullet on a digital balance. Then he measured it with an instrument called a micrometer. When the process was completed, he determined the bullet was a 44 caliber. It had come from one of the most powerful handguns on the market, a 44 Magnum revolver. Several companies manufacture such weapons. Vaughn had to determine the make and model of the one that shot the fatal bullet. He placed the bullet under a microscope and examined its rifling characteristics. All guns leave a series of spiral grooves on a bullet as it speeds down the barrel. The number of grooves, their width, and whether they twist to the left or right varies with the manufacturer. This particular bullet had six grooves and six lands, the raised regions in between. They spiraled along the bullet with a right-hand twist. Now Vaughn turned to a device called a measuring projection unit. It enabled him to accurately determine the widths of each land and groove. Armed with this information, Vaughn turned to a computer database called the General Rifling Characteristics File. Maintained by the FBI, it contains information about thousands of weapons. Feeding in the caliber, number, and width of lands and grooves, and the directional twist of the bullet enabled him to identify the probable make of the gun. We had a groove width measurement of 0.129 thousandths of an inch. When we then refer to the 44 Magnum caliber category, you will note that the probable make and model of firearm that could have fired the evidence bullet was a firearm manufactured by Sturm Ruger, and the model would be the Red Hawk model. Within two hours, Vaughn developed a vital piece of evidence. The gun was a Strum Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum. But a search of local gun shops turned up no record of any such weapon being sold. Vaughn decided the only way to trace the killer was to find where the bullet had been fired okay, from. An ammunition manual told him that a Ruger Red Hawk 44 Magnum has a maximum range of about a mile and a half. But the chances of locating where the bullet had been fired in an area that large would be next to impossible. To reduce the search area, Vaughn went back to the site of the killing to reconstruct the incident. All that he required was a mannequin, a lawn chair, and a wooden dowel. He seated the mannequin in the same place and position as the victim. Oops. 
Then he inserted the dowel through its body in the precise angle of the bullet wound. The dowel rod now represents the actual trajectory of the bullet. Since we have an entrance wound here on the right side and the bullet was recovered on the left side, you'll note that the dowel rod is pointing in this direction here. We will now refer to this as the alleged flight path of the bullet. The dowel pointed roughly northwest. If Vaughn was right, that was the direction from which the bullet had been fired. Back in his lab, he began to map out the area where the police should concentrate their search. This is a Bloomingdale Township map, which I was able to pick up at the highway department, uh, which I took to the scene. And it demonstrates or depicts the search area. Uh, you'll note this area here is the open field in which the spectators were seated waiting for the 4th of July fireworks to occur in this area here. The decedent was seated in a chair here. Now, we had determined by a quadrant that our search area was going to be to the north and northwest. But from where in this search area had the bullet been fired? Vaughn's references told him the muzzle velocity of a Red Hawk is 1,200 feet per second. But from the 15-inch deep wound in the dead man, a medical examiner estimated the bullet slowed down to less than 700 feet per second when it hit. With the help of a computer ballistics expert, Vaughn calculated how far the bullet must have traveled for its velocity to have been reduced to this amount. Uh, we came to realize that the impact velocity being approximately uh, 450 feet to 700 feet per second, that we would have to concentrate our s search in an area between 500 yards and 700 yards. So our search area would have been in this span right here. So what we did is we actually established a cone of origin, if you will, where we would focus our search from this line depicted here to this roadway, which is depicted here. After narrowing the search area, Vaughn and police combed the neighborhoods between 500 and 700 yards northwest of the picnic grounds. They conducted door-to-door -door interviews, searching for any evidence that a large caliber gun had been fired. Eventually, they arrived at a residence on Lawrence Avenue. During a search of the backyard, they made a crucial discovery. In a corner, was a 55-gallon drum perforated with holes. Vaughn felt they could have been made by 44 caliber bullets. The edges showed little sign of rust, suggesting they were new. Had they been made by the same magnum that killed the elderly man? To find out, Vaughn to had to recover one of the bullets, bullets and compare it to the bullet from the dead man. He relied once again on dowels to point him in the right direction. With luck, they'd lead him to a bullet. We have uh, evidence that the shots uh, were fired at an angle where they entered a little bit higher than they exited. Um, you also note that the metal on this side, that there's an indentation here, that the actual metal folds inside, which is indicative of the, this being where the bullet entered. And on the other side, we have evidence of the bullet exiting where the metal fold is actually folding towards the outside. So this is indicative of the bullet exiting. So we're going to take this dowel rod here and we're going to reconstruct the trajectory. In other words, the flight path of the bullet from the time it struck the 55 gallon drum until it exits. Again, you can see the actual metal around the periphery of the hole and the fact that it's folded out is indicative that this is an exit. So this would demonstrate that this bullet continuing in a straight, straight flight path would most likely have hit the grass somewhere in here. So what we're going to have to do is focus our search on this area. We're going to have to conduct a grit search. Vaughn and detectives spread out to find a bullet. Despite their thoroughness, they found nothing. Perhaps the barrel had been moved since the shots were fired through it. If so, metal detectors would be required to search a larger area. Then one of the deputy sheriffs had an idea. Perhaps the shooters had been burning logs in the barrel while using it as a target. Maybe the bullets were in the nearby pile of ashes. 
he sifted through the cinders and found what he was looking for. If Richard Vaughn could prove the bullet came from the same gun that killed the elderly man, he'd have the break he needed. When the man died in a picnic ground in Bloomingdale, Illinois on July 4th, police had only two clues, the bullet recovered at autopsy and the wound it left behind. Now, ballistic examiner Richard Vaughn had a second bullet, found near the 55-gallon drum. A comparison of the bullets would tell him if they came from the same gun. Every Ruger Red Hawk Magnum leaves similar rifling marks on a bullet. Six lands and grooves with a right-hand twist. But every gun also leaves its own unique individual signature on the bullets it fires, produced by tiny irregularities in the rifling. The bullet found in the drum was deformed by the impact, but Vaughn was still able to discern a series of distinguishing marks. They were enough to conclude it came from the same weapon that killed the victim. The net was closing in, but an important question remained. Could a bullet fired from the backyard travel unobstructed for nearly a half mile to the picnic grounds? Vaughn enlisted the help of an engineering firm to survey the bullet's likely path. They recorded ground elevations and the positions and heights of every house and tree between the Lawrence Avenue residence and the picnic grounds. Then they constructed a diagram. The red line here demonstrates the calculated trajectory of the fatal bullet. The dark line here demonstrates the terrain. We do have documented here the dwellings that fell within the line of the trajectory of the fatal bullet. Uh, what we were able to determine uh, was that this particular residence, for example, the bullet went directly to the right of it. But uh, this is, indicates where the barrel of the firearm was. Uh, this is the fence that was at the back of the property, of the suspect's property. And this is the area where the decedent was seated. On its half-mile journey to the picnic grounds were many potential obstacles. Amazingly, the bullet missed every one. But would it still possess enough power to kill once it got there? To make his case, Vaughn had to prove it could. He turned to wound ballistics expert Martin Fackler, who had devised a standardized way to test how far a bullet penetrates human flesh when traveling at various speeds. The depth of the wound depends on the velocity of the bullet. To simulate the penetrating power of a bullet after a half-mile flight, some gunpowder is removed to slow it down to between 400 and 700 feet per second. This is referred to as a bullet inertia puller, and we're going to use this to pull and separate the bullet from the cartridge case so that we are able to actually remove the gunpowder from the cartridge case. Now that the bullet has been separated... We Vaughn carefully tips out a measured amount of the gunpowder. It's a trial and error process. Empty out some powder, fire around. Measure the bullet's speed. If it's too high, remove a little more gunpowder. If it's too low, remove a little less from the next round. To ensure that the bullet impacts the block at the intended velocity, its speed is measured with an electronic timer. Uh, this is a chronograph. This is used to measure the speed of a moving projectile. It is nothing more than a timer, and the timer is started by the shadow of a bullet passing between these first two rods, and the timer is stopped by the shadow of a bullet passing between the second two rods. The Speed in feet per second of the projectile is then recorded in the front of the machine. Finally, when everything is set, the test bullet is fired into the gelatin. Firing in the hole. The bullet traveled 15 inches, almost identical to the depth of the fatal wound. What's more, like the bullet found in the victim, it had not deformed. The test proved 
that the bullet had enough power to kill the man from a half mile away. Further evidence that the shot had been fired from Lawrence Avenue. The results of Vaughn's test gave Assistant State's Attorney Joe Burkett grounds to serve a search warrant on Robert Logsdon, resident of the home where the drum was found. Logsdon admitted he and his girlfriend held a party on July 4th. But at first, he denied owning a handgun. As a convicted felon, it was illegal for him to possess one. He lied about virtually everything until he was confronted with facts that were known to us that we had put, put in the warrant, and he ultimately confessed and implicated his girlfriend as well in the shooting. There's a man who's dead. Under pressure from Burkett, Logsdon produced a 44 caliber Strum Ruger Redhawk. He later confessed and revealed the events of his party. It had started ordinarily enough, a barbecue for a few close friends. Sometime in the afternoon, Logsdon had gone into the house to fetch his Ruger Red Hawk. A jug of water was placed on the 55-gallon drum as a target. Logsdon fired off five rounds. One hit the jug, but four missed and hit the drum instead. Then he handed the gun to his girlfriend, whose shot missed the jug and drum completely. From Logsdon's statement, Vaughn determined that the girlfriend fired the fatal bullet. Because she was shorter than Logsdon, she tilted the gun higher. The increased angle gave the bullet a trajectory high enough to reach the picnic grounds. Logsdon pleaded guilty to unlawful use of a handgun, to possessing a stolen weapon, and to involuntary manslaughter. His girlfriend also admitted firing the gun and likewise pleaded guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Logsdon was sentenced to six years. His girlfriend received 90 days plus probation. It was really just a tremendously successful investigation because um, as with any murder or any homicide, uh, police, police officers and prosecutors don't take holidays. So we worked closely with the sheriff's office, the coroner's office, Bloomingdale Police Department, uh, Sergeant Vaughn in the crime lab, all, everybody did an excellent job. In Bloomingdale, victim and killer were completely unaware of each other's existence and were a half mile apart. It took the tools of forensic science and the dedication of law enforcement professionals and ballistics experts to bridge the gap. The Bloomingdale death was a tragic accident caused by carelessness and an astonishing twist of fate. Its randomness made it a challenge to solve. In Chicago, during the turbulent 1960s, an investigator struggled with a different challenge. A political activist lay dead. Was he killed in self-defense or assassinated? The bullet-riddled walls held the answer. December 4th, 1969, 4.45 a.m. 14 police officers, handpicked by Illinois State Attorney Edward Hanrahan, approached an apartment in Chicago's Oak Park area, the heart of the city's black ghetto. They were about to embark on what would become one of the most controversial events in Chicago's history. The first floor apartment was occupied by members of the Black Panther Party, a militant left-wing organization that preached social revolution. As the main group of police entered the front, a smaller force came in at the back. Fifteen minutes later, the tiny two-bedroom apartment was laced with 100 bullets. When the smoke cleared, two young Panthers were dead, four more were injured, two of them seriously. Two policemen received superficial wounds. The raid yielded a cache of arms, 19 guns and boxes of ammunition. Among the dead was Fred Hampton, age 21, the charismatic leader of the Panthers' Illinois chapter. Black people need some peace. White people need some peace. And we are going to have to fight we're going to have to struggle. We're going to have to struggle relentlessly to bring about some peace. 
Hampton was the 28th Black Panther killed by police in less than two years. The Black Panthers emerged in Oakland, California, a product of the 1960s social unrest. While black leaders such as Martin Luther King advocated civil disobedience and political action to advance civil rights, the Panthers seemed prepared to use violence if necessary. The December 4th raid quickly became a media event as the Panthers and the authorities gave radically different accounts of what happened. Hanrahan claimed the police were serving a legitimate search warrant when the Panthers started shooting. When the police officers announced their office, they were fired upon. In a film demonstration, the police gave their account of the raid. In this version, Panther Mark Clark was sitting in a chair in the living room. He fired a shotgun through the front door as police approached. Police then burst in and shot him dead. As more Panthers began shooting, the exchange escalated. There were three shots fired from the rear bedroom. They were directed directly at the back door uh, as I was coming in. I backed out again. According to police, when they entered Hampton's bedroom, they found him in bed, lying on his stomach. He opened fire with a 45 caliber automatic and a shotgun. In self-defense, they shot him twice in the head. But the Black Panthers told a different tale. The police burst in without warning, started shooting, and killed Mark Clark, who fired only after being fired upon. No other Panther used a weapon. More police stormed in from the back, found Fred Hampton asleep, and shot him twice in the head before he had a chance to wake up. Hampton's girlfriend was in bed with him when the raid began. Still half asleep, I looked up, and I saw bullets coming from it looked like the front of the apartment, from the kitchen area. And they were, the pigs were just shooting. Um, when he looked up, just looked up, he didn't say a word, and he didn't move, except for moving his head up. He laid his head back down to the side like that. He never said a word, and he never got up out the bed. The Panthers were convinced that Fred Hampton was assassinated and that police had launched a full-scale cover-up. Panther lawyer Skip Andrew acted as their spokesman. Anyone who went through that apartment and examined the evidence that was remaining there could come to only one conclusion, and that is that Fred Hampton, 21 years old and a member of a militant, well-known militant group, was murdered in his bed, probably as he lay asleep. Police arrested the surviving Panthers and charged them with several offenses, including attempted murder. To defend the Panthers, their lawyers needed evidence to support their version of the raid. They turned to ballistics expert Herbert McDonnell. He seemed an unlikely choice. More than once, he had investigated gunfights between the police and black radical groups. He usually sided with the police. I understood it was a shootout similar to the ones I'd investigated before in the Republic of New Africa and Fred Ahmed Evans and others. So I expected this would be another black militant group who were in the wrong and the police were in the right. As McDonald saw his role, it was to decide whether the police or the Panther account of the raid was nearer the truth. To determine this, he would have to reconstruct the raid from bullet holes and spent bullets in the apartment. It would take all of McDonald's skill to find out what happened. He entered the apartment through a small foyer, which led to the living room. Mark Clark, the first Panther to die, had been shot here. Beyond the living room were two bedrooms. Fred Hampton had died in the farther one. Finally, at the back lay the kitchen, through which the rear contingent of Hanrahan's force had entered. McDonald started his investigation in the living room. I spent ten and a half hours collecting evidence, taking photographs, and observing the trajectories of various bullets. 
I had never seen an area that had been so shot up as the living room. On one wall, the south wall, there were 45 bullet holes of various calibers. The larger ones were 45 caliber fired from a Thompson submachine gun. There were blasts from shotguns, and there were 30 caliber and 38. Having different sizes made it somewhat easy to establish which were fired from various weapons. Who had fired these shots, the Panthers or the police? McDonnell hoped his investigation would provide the answer. Come on in. As streams of sightseers Where? trooped through the apartment, McDonnell set to work, unpacking the simple tools of his trade, a camera, notebook, ruler, and a ball of string. Soon, he made a curious request. I asked if I could have some straws brought in and some dowels. The panthers went out, some of them, and they came back very quickly with a big handful of straws and a bundle of dowels, small ones. After measuring the precise position of every hole in the living room wall, McDonald gently pushed the dowels and straws into them. By following the direction of a dowel, he could trace the path of a bullet. The straws protected the holes, ensuring that a dowel did not knock out plaster and destroy vital evidence. When he finished, the result was startling. All 45 bullets had been fired from the vicinity of the living room door. All must have come from the police as they burst into the room. When I began looking at the number of bullet holes, it became apparent that the vast majority seemed to be coming into the apartment rather than going out. The investigation seemed to be favoring the Panthers' version of the raid, but the police were quick to state their case. In an interview with the Chicago Tribune, Hanrahan produced a photograph of bullet holes in the molding around the back door. He called it irrefutable evidence that the Panthers had fired at the police as they entered from the rear of the apartment. Reporters studied the photos. One of the four pictures you gave the Tribune had two bullet holes on the right side of what was supposed to be the rear door. But when reporters inspected the apartment, they found the marks to be not holes, but nails. Hanrahan backpedaled. I have said that uh, we released the pictures. We have not characterized or described uh, the uh, conditions that they portray, other than to say that that is an accurate portrayal of that uh, particular object. Now the police changed their story. The panther bullets, they said, whistled through the open door. That is not what McDonnell found. The claims that there were bullets fired out at the police out the back door are unfounded. There is no way the bullets could not have hit a person in the door, and if they missed them, they would have struck a brick wall. McDonald continued his investigation in the front bedroom, where he discovered bullets fired in the living room had passed through the wall. While in the bedroom, he noticed the door was also pierced by bullets. He counted 25 of them. The police had claimed panthers in the bedroom shot at them and refused to stop firing despite orders from officers. At first sight, the door seemed to confirm this part of the police's story. All the shots in the door came from the inside out exactly what would be expected if panthers in the bedroom had been shooting at the police. But there was a puzzle. None of those 25 shots hit an officer, nor was there any trace of them in the hallway beyond. But on closer examination, if those bullets were fired when the door was closed, as was claimed by the police, they would have struck the hall right across from that bedroom door. There was not one point of impact there. So having the dowels between the living room and that bedroom recessed, I could open the door all the way. And then all I had to do was to push the dowels from the living room side, and out of the 25 holes in the door, 25 were explained by the bullets coming from the living room when the door was wide open. When these shots had been fired, he concluded, the bedroom door was open roughly parallel to the bedroom wall. 
bullets fired by the police in the living room passed through the wall, then continued on through the door. By now, the evidence was overwhelming. Of all the bullets fired, only one, a shotgun blast in the living room door, seemed to have been fired by a Black Panther. This was beginning to look like a very one-sided gunfight. There were at least 99 fired in. So when you have 99 to 1, it's not a shootout. It's a shoot-in. But what happened in the back bedroom when Hampton lost his life? Was he waiting in bed, ready to fire, as police claimed? Or was he asleep and murdered in cold blood by the police, as the Panthers insisted? The trajectory of the bullets through his skull might solve the riddle. On January 3, 1970, a federal grand jury ordered Hampton's body exhumed. Two earlier autopsies had given conflicting results. One, conducted by the Cook County coroner, reported that the two bullets in his head came from opposite directions. That suggested he was awake and moving. Hampton's relatives arranged a second one by a private pathologist. He found that both bullets had struck from the right and traveled on roughly parallel paths, suggesting Hampton was lying down. The new autopsy confirmed the second one regarding the trajectory. Both shots had entered Hampton's head from the right. The findings supported the Black Panther's claim that Hampton had been asleep, lying on his back with his head down. From the trajectory into the head of Fred Hampton, both shots were fired in nearly parallel trajectories which projected back to the doorway. So if one policeman came in and fired a shot, uh, Fred would have still been lying in that position when the second person came in with a different caliber and fired a second shot at what probably was either a dead or dying person. McDonald's meticulous investigation and the autopsy supported the Panther version of events. It looked as if the police had indeed assassinated Fred Hampton. But the most crucial question had not yet been answered. Did the Panthers or the police fire first? If the Panthers had started the shooting, even if they had fired just a single shot, the police could maintain they shot back only in self-defense. To answer this question, McDonnell performed his most dazzling piece of detective work. The gunfight evidently had started as the police stormed the living room. McDonald found that the living room door contained two bullet holes. His examination of powder marks and wood splinters established that one bullet came from outside, from a police 38 revolver. He recovered the bullet from the living room wall. A second, larger hole likely came from Mark Clark's shotgun. After blasting a hole in the door panel, the slug had gone through a wall and ended up in the stairwell outside the apartment. McDonnell had an idea. By figuring out how far the door was open when the 38 bullet and the shotgun slug passed through it, he might be able to tell who shot first. He traced the bullet's paths as they flew through the door. He knew that, by their own admission, the police had forced open the door as the raid began. He threaded a string through the 38 caliber hole in the door to the 38 hole in the wall. Then he adjusted the door until the string was straight. The door was barely ajar. Next, he ran a line from the slug hole in the stairwell through the hole in the door and then to Mark Clark's chair. This time, when the string was pulled straight, the door was three quarters open. Through his experiments, McDonald pieced together the scenario. As police pushed open the door at the start of the raid, they fired the 38. As it swung open further, a Panther shotgun went off. That was the only evidence of any shot being fired out. McDonald's conclusion was clear. The police fired first. According to McDonald's findings, the police broke in, firing a 38 caliber pistol as they slammed open the living room door. A Panther 
presumably Mark Clark, returned the fire. As the fusillade of police bullets poured into the apartment, Panthers fled to the second bedroom, where they tried in vain to awaken Fred Hampton. When the police reached the bedroom, they shot Hampton twice in the head. In court, charges against the surviving seven Black Panthers were eventually dropped. No indictments were ever handed down against State Attorney Hanrahan or the 14 officers involved in the raid. But Hanrahan's credibility had been tarnished and his political career was ruined. Twelve years later, in a civil suit brought by the Panther survivors, the raiders were found liable and the city ordered to pay $1.8 million in damages. McDonald's detailed investigation helped to tip the scales and ensure that in the end, justice was done. It's been 30 years since Fred Hampton's death, but today, crime solving takes as much tenacity and ingenuity as ever. Investigators are finding a new ally in the computer. It's proving time and again that a criminal's past can catch up with him. On March 8, 1996, a young boy was spending the evening as any 12-year-old would when tragedy struck. gang war simmered on the streets of his New Orleans neighborhood. The boy became a casualty of that war, a bullet in his head from a senseless drive-by shooting. Within minutes, police and paramedics were on the scene. They rushed to save the boy's life, but from the start, the prognosis looked grim. Homicide detectives from the New Orleans Police Department began interviewing eyewitnesses. Two men who had run for safety when the drive-by occurred returned to the scene. One of them was the victim's uncle. The men admitted to police that they were the intended victims. They recognized the car and identified the trigger man as Kevin Jordan, a gang member and drug dealer. Meanwhile, the child was taken to the hospital. 15 hours later, he died. As the search for Kevin Jordan started, Sergeant Michael Rice and John Treadaway, firearms examiner for the New Orleans police, began their own quest. Two bullets had been found at the crime scene, and a third had been recovered from the little boy. Could they link those bullets to a gun, and then link that gun to the killer? Uh, the bullet was placed in our evidence room and it was delivered to the firearm section for me to examine. But examining the bullet, I found that it was a 38 caliber having a six right rifling twist. Most drive-by shootings involve semi-automatic handguns, but this bullet was fired from a revolver. So I was able to inform the detective bureau that the gun that was used was uh, a 38 caliber revolver. But were all three bullets fired from the same 38? <laughs> to find out, Treadaway had to compare the fine details of each one. So, do you see how pronounced this is? If you look up on the monitor in the yes. groove, uh -huh. you can see about uh, two thirds of the way down the trigger match. It notches on the following land and the following groove. This is a, this no is doubt. a hit, no okay. doubt at all. This is a, both, both bullets fired from the same weapon, no doubt. Okay. I think this is what they needed. Now, detectives in the field knew that only a single 38 revolver had been used. Until they found it, there was little more that Treadaway could do. Open the door, please! Whoa, man. Whoa, man. The detectives, man? meanwhile, learned the name of the driver. He was Henry Talley. They also found out he owned a 38 caliber revolver. On March 16th, they arrived at Tally's home, armed with search warrants. A search turned up drug paraphernalia, marijuana, crack cocaine, and three guns, including his 38 caliber revolver. 
he was taken in for questioning. Tally's weapons were confiscated and sent to Treadaway at the ballistics laboratory. Could he tie the 38 revolver to the bullet that killed the boy? If so, the police could build a solid case against Tally and the alleged trigger man, Kevin Jordan, who had already been arrested on suspicion of murder. The first order of business was testing for fingerprints. Had Tally or Jordan last fired the gun and left prints on the trigger? Timothy Susano, a fingerprint expert with New Orleans Police Department, demonstrates how he finds them. Latent fingerprints, prints invisible to the naked eye, are developed in a two-stage process. The first involves fumigating with superglue. Molecules of the glue will stick to a print. Then you want to take your liquid superglue and pour it into the lumen dish. Next, I'm going to place the lumen dish onto a hot plate that's located inside this tank. That's going to heat the superglue and accelerate the fuming process. Within an hour, the gun is cooked. Now it's ready for the second stage of the test. It's washed with a fluorescent dye. If any prints exist, the dye will adhere to them and become visible under the ultraviolet light source. Unfortunately, none showed up on the 38 found at Tally's residence. The test could not help pin the shooting on Tally or Jordan. Still, the test is often worth performing. Sometimes it can yield dramatic results. This is an example of a uh, partial latent fingerprint that was developed on the trigger guard of a weapon that was used in a murder. As you can see, the partial fingerprint right here, that's on the front part of the trigger guard, which is located right here. To establish a connection between Tally's gun and the fatal bullet, Treadaway needed to inspect a bullet shot from the gun. In this room is our ballistic tank that we test fire our weapons in. This is Officer Gwen Serpass. He's going to test fire these weapons. We're going to test fire this uh, 38 first. Uh, before we do anything with it, uh, we normally like to check to make sure that the weapon is functional. Uh, make, we make sure that there are no obstructions in the barrel and uh, all the parts on the weapon are in place. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and load it. We need to put some ear protection on, uh, it gets a little loud in here. The gun is fired into an 800 gallon tank of water, informally called the hot tub. Water halts the bullet without distorting its shape or marking its surface. Once the weapon's fired, I then re uh, unload the weapon, remove the spent casings. The bullet retrieval system is simple but effective. A broom handle and a lump of silly putty. Once the bullet was recovered, its markings were examined and compared with bullets found at the crime scene. The match was undeniable. So I performed my test fire and examined the bullet, the test bullet, under the microscope with the three bullets that I received previously and determined that that gun had fired those three bullets. Tally's gun had indeed shot the little boy. Both Tally and Jordan were convicted felons, and by now the New Orleans police had enough evidence to charge Jordan with murder. But they suspected that the guns found in Tally's house had been used in other crimes. Could a new computer system implicate Tally in past crimes? When the 12-year-old boy died in a drive-by shooting in 1996, New Orleans police had a brand new crime-solving tool available. Earlier that year, they installed the Integrated Ballistic Identification System, or IBIS. It dramatically speeds up the time it takes to match bullets from crime scenes to guns confiscated by police. Sergeant Michael Rice runs the IBIS operation.
for him, it's a vast improvement from the old method. We would go and physically get these guns and test fire them and examine them on the uh, microscope. Well, right now, uh, with, with our Ibis system, we can now simply, as a matter of routine, test fire these weapons and put them into Ibis. This image will then be correlated and uh, uh, checked against all of our current database. And if this gun had been used in a crime, we will know about it uh, in, in a very short period of time, perhaps within the hour. At the heart of IBIS is a sophisticated computer program linked to an elaborate microscope. Attached to the microscope are two tiny video cameras. When a test bullet is placed under one of the cameras, its magnified image appears on the screen. Greg McRae is one of the New Orleans detectives trained to use the new system. We have the uh, projectile, the bullet itself, mounted on a little fixture with the information recorded on it. Uh, it's glued on here. We're going to mount it to the machine, rotate it, and lock it in. At the flip of a switch, the cradle begins to move turning the bullet through one complete revolution, scanning an image of the bullet into the computer. As you can see, you see striations, uh, you see groovings, you see markings. As we move it down, we'll take a picture of it. Uh, the machine digitizes this picture as it takes it. Now, when we process it, it is, the picture is taken and then processed digitally from this machine into the next machine, the next computer, which will in turn correlate it. Built into IBIS is a program designed to scan each image for its distinctive pattern of marks or lines. Having picked it out, the program searches through its database looking for other images of bullets that match. Within less than a minute, it can scrutinize thousands of bullets a task that would take a ballistics expert like John Treadaway years to perform. This part of IBIS is called bulletproof. A second subsystem, Brass Catcher, enables him to scan and match spent shells. The casing, which is the other section of the bullet, would be put in this area here, and locked in here and secured. This particular uh, microscope will take a picture with the camera mounted up here of the back end, or I should say the breech face of that casing, the breech face and also the firing pin which is in this area right here. Now the computer records the shell's distinctive features, the positions and shapes of indentations left by the firing pin and tiny gouges left as it's ejected from the weapon. The operation is completed in two to three minutes. IBIS had been installed less than a month when a bullet from the 38 revolver that killed the 12-year-old boy was entered into it. There were no hits, no matches with the thousands of other bullets in the computer's database. But the system's real power was demonstrated with bullets test-fired from a second gun, a 45 caliber automatic found in Henry Talley's apartment. The firing pin, which we're looking at, if you look very closely, you can see this duck image right here, uh, center in the firing pin itself. But this is very clear. We knew from looking at the screen that the probability of a match was, was very, very high. Ibis made a hit, implicating Henry Talley in another unsolved drive-by shooting. It was enough to strengthen the case against him regarding the death of the child. IBIS had proved itself on its first case. Prior to IBIS, this case would have probably been unsolved. It would have never, been, never picked up any additional follow-up unless there was a specific reason for it. We have um, uncovered and linked uh, uh, many, many cases involving uh, homicides as well as uh, shootings here in the city. And we made those links and those uh, correlations and, and tied them all together by simply what Greg's doing right now. And uh, we're kind of proud of what we do here. And um, I, would, I would not want to be without Ibis today. 
The death of the 12-year-old boy was solved partly by traditional ballistics work. But without the IBIS computer system, police would never have connected Tally's weapons to another crime that might have otherwise gone unsolved. Both Kevin Jordan and Henry Talley were convicted of first-degree murder and are now serving life sentences. By developing new ways to trace bullets to guns and guns to criminals, forensic detectives are increasingly able to turn a criminal's own ammunition against him. So long as there's a bullet, there's a clue. And so long as there's a clue, there's a chance to catch a killer.